Welcome everybody to today's Coffee Talk. Um, I am Skylar Carter and I am going to be joined um, by our founder and director, Dr. Andrea Roberts in just a moment um, and some really special guests um, today to talk about some Black Digital Humanities projects and the way that um, the digital humanities field is impacting preservation and Black settlements here in Texas and all over. Um, our guests today include um, Stephanie Lang and uh, Sarah Potvin. Um, I want to um, first, before giving an introduction about our guests, I want to go over. Um, I just want to thank everybody. Thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, I want to also thank our Adopt the County volunteers that will be joining us um, in a couple of weeks at our first working session um, for our outreach program and um, working on some, um, some of our crowdsourced data and, and getting more involved with the project. Um, I want to also thank those who did their homework from our last coffee talk and really getting involved with the, um, the Atlas and getting familiar with that. Um, I also want to, to thank our students in, in our previous classes who have participated in Freedom Colony assignments and helped us to gather information about more of our um, settlements and our freedom colonies that are listed and that are not um, listed just yet on our atlas, but you can help us to add those points um, if you join our working session, which I'll get into a little bit later. And um, right now, I just want to welcome uh, Dr. Roberts and, and invite her to join us um, so we can get started with our discussion with our special guests. Yes, I want to get I want to get quickly right into uh, our working with our guests because they do have other engagements uh, today. But I want to give a framework for what it is we're talking about when we say Black digital humanities. We're really talking about an approach to conserving and protecting the heritage associated with African American settlements. And there's a number of ways to do that. One of the ways we do that is through our atlas. And our atlas is a mechanism for doing the uh, various, or achieving the various goals we have as the Texas Freedom Colonies Project. We have three goals. First, as Texas Freedom Colonies Project, we are committed to identifying, recording, and mapping historic Black places. And we do that through first interacting with descendants and helping them uh, record their stories and locations and information about their communities. Uh, we do that also through uh, co-creating uh, research on issues that matter to freedom colonies. And of course we do that in a way that most people are familiar with, which is the Atlas. And so today I wanna talk to two people who've been really, really pivotal in the development of the field of black digital humanities and digital humanities period. And that would be Sarah Potvin, um, as well as Stephanie Lang. And these women are important to me. Uh, Stephanie and I, uh, Stephanie, when was it that we first met? I think that we first interacted maybe at a conference. I think it was the um, uh, Black Communities Conference, I think was one of the first places where I saw you talk about the Reclaim uh, work that you do. So uh, tell us what Reclaim is. Certainly. And I will say I knew about you, I think, before um, we met, because anytime I talk about any of my work, they're like, you need to meet Dr. Andrea Roberts. So, and it was just instinct, I think, chemistry and when we connect. Yeah. Work with me. So, yes. So Reclaim really is a organization that looks at the lost, stolen and hidden narratives of Black folks throughout the diaspora and works to kind of tell these stories through an artistic lens and um, kind of recognizing the power of art as um, an artist, right? As keepers of the truth and the power of mm. storytelling. And um, if you want me to kind of share kind of how- Yeah, please do. Sure. So, um, you know, I am a native Texan. I, my family on my mother's side has been in um, Austin in the surrounding areas since um, really Austin came to be, right? Since the, mm -hmm. at least the 1850s. And 
there was a lot of frustration for me around knowing that a lot of these stories weren't being told. A lot of this history wasn't being told. And with the way this ever-changing landscape and just this concern around, you know, how much we are losing of this history. Um, and that what was happening around gentrification and displacement, um, especially in historic East Austin, wasn't anything new. So um, for me, I wanted to just one day connect it to my birthday, go with a photographer to mm -hmm. certain areas and kind of tell these stories and take pictures. So that idea kind of turned into being, you know, invited by the galleries at Black Studies to do a um, to do a event, an exhibition on. Um, and it was going to be on Clarksville, which is one of the areas where I am a, a descendant, um, Freedom Colony, Austin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, where people know Clarksville is the one that really people know about in 1871. And so I had this idea of um, having this kind of static, here are some of the homes that are here now. And, you know, kind of a speaking to um, gentrification and displacement. And what I realized was the land, the geography, the folks that were still connected to, um, to um, Clarksville, this amazing history of organizing um, and just this tight knit community had its own story to tell. And so instead of me kind of deciding what that story needed to be, I needed to just step back and, and find ways to let that come through. And so I worked with two amazing photographers, mm. Celeste Henry and Akeem Adewumi, and then that's how um, that came to be. And then from there, it just opened up so many things and that's how I started Reclaim. So starting with the, um, photo exhibition and then I've done work in um, Historic East Austin, was part of a documentary um, called The Legacy of, of East 12th Street, um, worked oh, with wow. right, the city of Austin, worked with Public City, which is a curatorial organization. Mm -hmm. And then um, from there, I've done more work with them. I did work with the Peace Park Conservancy, uh, kind of unpacking that history of Peace Park yeah. um, and engaging with the community around what they wanted to see there, you know, in light of, for a lot of people didn't realize that that was, um, you know, a plantation and that people were enslaved there. So. Right. right. So, so let me make sure people get more context for, for your work. Yeah. So you are someone who lives in the city of Austin and someone who is affiliated with the University of Texas from which you know I graduated and lived in Austin for six years myself. Right. But tell us what you do formally with the University of Texas, if you will. Sure. So um, I was with Black Studies for almost 15 years um, mm -hmm. with the Field Center, um, basically program administrator. Um, and then actually almost two years ago now, I was brought on because of this work connected to Reclaim and my work in the mm. community um, to kind of lead all of the preservation efforts for the Center for Community Engagement that is with the Division of Diversity and Community Engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, this summer, I was asked to take on and leading the work of equity and community advocacy, which is one of the portfolios under the Center for Community Engagement. And we really work to amplify the voices of the community and to leverage the resources of UT, right, with what is needed, what, what is happening in the community. And so a big part of that is again, around preservation. So I have been really um, fortunate to work with a bunch of amazing folks and organizations to continue doing this preservation work, very similar to what I do with the claim. So I, I want to get an idea of what the labor is like for you. And when I say what the labor is like, mm -hmm. is that, you know, you're with the university, you're a descendant, you're an African American living in Austin, which we no has its own challenges. Uh, as quiet as it's kept, uh, the African-American experience in Austin is uh, complicated at best. Mm -hmm. And so I, I hope that you can speak to really briefly 
what it is like to be a descendant and to engage in this work of reclaiming mm -hmm. in a space where people are very enamored and interested in East Austin and have their own ideas and project their own uh, sort of goals and needs and wants onto what they think East Austin is. How do you contend with that? Um, what, what is that like? Yeah, wonderful question. And that's something that I'm still um, trying to balance to be very honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, especially with my work with Reclaim that is intersected and connected in some ways with my work with um, UT. Um, there well, are maybe not the UT piece as much as I'm, I'm asking more about your positionality as a descendant Right. You're doing a, a form of research, you're doing engaged research, even aside from the university and doing reclaim uh, yeah. and creating it and birthing the methodology and approach. Mm -hmm. And what is it like in a place that's losing its African-American population, uh, a place when we're talking about Clarksville that is dramatically, you know, the, the actual footprint of African-Americans there is nearly gone. Mm -hmm. if, you know, say for a few particular buildings or structures, mm -hmm. you know, what is it like being an African-American in that space, trying to do this work, knowing that, you know, you are very much um, sometimes the object of the work and you're assumed to be the object of work rather than the actor. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's, it's, extremely difficult, um, especially because what brought me to this work, you know, was me trying to also learn about my own, you know, family history. So in learning about my own family history and, you know, the sensitivities and complexities connected to that. And, you know, as I'm continuing this work, as I think in most of these cases, there's so much that we don't know about this history. And so I'm continuing to discover things and ways in which my family is intertwined in a lot of this history mm. in ways that is beautiful, but then it's complex and it, it makes my relationship with this work even more complicated, right? right. Especially right. when you know, I'm asked to be part of certain projects where I'm still trying to come to, you know, to reckon with and come to terms with the, my family being enslaved in a certain area or how they were treated in a certain community where they're not there any longer. And so it's very difficult to be kind of asked to switch into these different hats, but that being part of my history is also, I think what is very important about what I bring into this work. So yes, it's very mm -hmm. challenging. Um, there are times when, and we've had this conversation, there's this idea around um, people consuming and even commodifying black grief. And feeding and on, frankly. Feeding on black yeah. grief. And that there have been times when I've been asked to be part of conversations where, you know, there's these pointed questions around how does it feel for you being from these communities where, you know, there's less and less of presence of black folks and you've been, your community has been, you know, displaced or gentrified, right? This is a a question that like, how, how do I have these conversations? It doesn't mean that it's not important, but I am so personally connected um, that it's like, how do I pull myself away to have these conversations that are also gonna be harmful for me? Absolutely, you know, right? taking care of yourself in this work. I mean, this is a whole layer of experience and research mm -hmm. that I don't think the university first equips you to do. Often it doesn't encourage you to do it, except to the extent that it educates others and edifies others and not you. Right. And so I wonder what you're thinking around um, some different ways of not just doing the work, but supports that you think are needed in order to go about doing this reclaiming, aggregating and communicating through the digital space and doing the kind of work you're doing. What, what do you think we need to be doing more of? What do we need? Yeah, wonderful question. I think one of the things is there, we have to be really honest with ourselves, those of us who are doing this work. Um, yes. There, it, it takes quite a bit of sacrifice, right? Because there are a lot of things about this work. There's a lot of truth telling that has to be done that people sometimes are very uncomfortable with, right? And okay. it can impede and impact our careers, you know? I mean, I'm fortunate to be in a situation where that hasn't happened, but I know that that is always the case 
you know, many times, especially in academia. Um, there are many people who are the gatekeepers for a lot of this work who, Absolutely. you know, kind of keep certain people out of that. You know, I think that we all kind of have to realize how we're complicit in what we're talking about, right? This, this, yeah. this erasure, there are certain conversations that are had um, that I think are problematic sometimes in some of these spaces and even how people are you know, projecting the the narratives, right? These kind of um, romanticized, watered down ideas of, you know, who has been like a true friend to the to our communities and who hasn't, you know. So I think, I, I think that's I think that's really key. As I bring Sarah into the conversation, and Sarah, I want you to engage with us around, you know, you having been in digital humanities work for a while. We know each other as colleagues at Texas A and M. And we know each other as people who've been working together in something I started in 2018, the African American uh, Digital Humanities Working Group on Texas A&M's campus. And we've really been trying to do the development work, I think, <laughs> of creating the infrastructure and the support needed to sustain this kind of work on our campus. And I, I'm interested to have you be in conversation with Stephanie as someone who's not African American but has been trying to do critical digital humanities work. And I want you to, if you don't mind, speak to some of the thoughts that are coming up for you as you're hearing uh, Stephanie and I engage on the positionality piece. Yeah, it's such a complicated and interesting question. I mean, I, I was thinking um, as you were asking this that I have the, I think this reflects some tremendous privilege. No one has really ever asked me to define my positionality before. So we talk about positionality, but right. I don't have to say, come in and say, I come in with this background and this is who I am and what I, what I represent. Um, and that's sort of stunning for me to, uh, to realize and to work through. Um, Yes, and I think, so I'm a librarian, I'm, a, I'm the digital scholarship librarian at Texas A&M, and I, I went to UT for grad school, so um, this conversation about Austin and UT is resonating with me as well. Um, but, you know, libraries are really trying to, at this moment of working through the acknowledgement that libraries are not neutral, um, and I think there are a lot of structures and assumptions within libraries and that librarians and curators, archivists make that we are these, these stewards, um, these neutral participants, these facilitators that don't necessarily have a stake or an identity that is forward in that work. And that of course is, um, is a lie. And <laughs> right. libraries are beginning to reconcile with that and to put positionality more uh, more forward within that. But I think and this conversation is making me realize more that there's a institutional positionality, but it ne hasn't necessarily translated to personal positionality within, mm. within mm. life. So that's interesting because um, as we are at a place with Texas Freedom College Project where you and I and Rebecca Hankins and other folks are, are have our hands in a lot of different pots in terms of gro growing BIPOC conservation and heritage and truth telling, on Texas A&M's campus, just more holistically, when you're saying as an institution, a PWI, a land grant, as UT is, as Texas A&M is, uh, whether you're black or white or what have you, but yours, if you're associated with those institutions and you go to communities of color, specifically black communities and say, I wanna engage with you around your heritage and, your, <laughs> and engage with you around you know, uh, your place heritage, and conserving your ephemera and, and all of that, um, it's, a, it's complicated and people may not be interested in handing things over to you, right? And so some of what you and I have been talking about, Sarah, is the ethics of this work. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could talk about it, since it, what we mean by ethics and what we mean by critical, because part of what we do is critical work. I do critical heritage work. Uh, you do critical digital humanities um, and scholarship and, and library and study is in library studies. Can you speak to any of that? Yeah, I, um, I spent a bunch of time yesterday working on this article that is one of these, you know, two years of the makings article 
um, about open access policies and land grants. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's the working title is a, a critical survey of institutional open access policies and land grants. But I was joking with my co-author that it's it's not critical at this point. It's sort of an evisceration of these <laughs> institutions, um, and especially because looking at land grants really is it really is a history of segregated education in the United States in terms of how they were set up, how the HP set, HPCUs were set up and endowed, um, mm. the persistent deep inequities in funding, especially at state level matching between these institutions. Um, and your original question was about having a critical perspective and that critical approach. Um, and can you remind me? I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess I'm sort of, when we say critical, you know, we have a broad audience, right? You were asking, yes. getting, who's our audience? And I said, our audience are seasoned academics who are experts in digital humanities and black studies and individuals who um, may just be here to hear black history and you know, may not interact um, online very often at all and may not even have an undergraduate degree. So we're the full range. So if we say critical and we say things like critical race, what are we even talking about, Sarah? That's what I'm, I'm trying <laughs> to get you to kind of elucidate a little bit or explain. Yes, what totally. is critical digital humanities? Why are you doing that work? Why, why are you even connected with any of this? So for me, that work is really connected to um, asking provocative questions, trying to make change, trying to advocate for our institutions to do better, for our government to do better, for us to do better mm -hmm. as individuals. So I guess I approach it from um, sort of a progressive framework of how can how can we intervene? What is the intervention here? How can things be improved? Um, I think one of the really extraordinary things to your point about ownership and handing things over to these institutions that um, don't have a history of behaving well in a lot of these areas right. of ownership and you know the colonialism that's just implicit with collecting to begin with. Exactly. Um, I think one of the really extraordinary things about the Texas Freedom Colonies Project is the assertion of ownership by the community, the formal assertion of ownership. And one of the things I've been really interested in from a library perspective, so I work on digital. And in grad school, my digital archives professor would talk a lot about the digital, the affordances of digital. And what does it mean to have an affordance? Well, digital things are, are really, are really interesting and very different from physical. So libraries, when they used to collect physical and deal only in physical, if there was one item and if you owned it, you owned it and you were responsible for it, you were responsible for its stewardship and you had yes. custody of the item. And as we're moving into a digital way of, I mean, here we are over Zoom, as we move into digital interactions and digital collecting, um, things just get so complicated in terms of what is possible with the digital and how the digital allows you to have multiple copies, um, how it can possibly separate that stewardship, which means you're taking care of something and making sure that it's going to persist, uh -huh. it's going to be preserved from custody where someone else may be able to own it. So right. I'm really, one of the things I just am in love with, with this project and with your work is that separation of custody and stewardship and the way that you can say, this is community owned, community controlled, and the potential though to have partners with stewardship. Because I think one of, and I would, I would love to hear otherwise, but one of the things that I think um, libraries and community archives struggle with in this post-custodial age yeah. when you might have material that is stewarded by one group and owned by another is how to make sure that those materials can, that they'll still be there in 20 years. The preservation question is, is really hard. Um, and it's hard for libraries, which have this deep ongoing commitment to preservation, although we're always struggling with the funding yeah. to sustain that. Of so course. that sustainability piece um, I think really ends up necessitating partnerships with institutions and especially in a digital sphere where some of the alternatives are, are commercial platforms 
which have right. their own ethical issues. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, yeah, you're torn. You're you're like, okay, here's this commercial thing we know it can work and it's dependable, and then it's like, oh well, here's this code, and what if the code needs to change, and who's going to pay for the person who knows the code, who's going to continually change it? So we're we're in a we have some precarity here. You know, yes, absolutely. Um, either way, in, in either instance, Stephanie, do you want to opine here around any of this, around the ethics questions? And um, just that, yes, I agree. <laughs> Coming from a call and response culture, I had to get on me because I was like, mm -hmm, yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. And um, it, it made me think about um, when thinking about challenges, this idea of you know scholarship and activism, like this connection, right? And this work yeah. that you're doing is clearly there. Um, you know, the important work that Sarah's talking about as well and wanting more folks to kind of do that instead of just this kind of way in which we're consuming this information and, and this material to, to then produce something, you know, making sure that the community's voices and their stories are centered, right? And really work yes. in relationship with them. Um, yeah, and that's the hard part too, because people have different expectations for what it need, means to co-create and different expectations for what it means to conserve and to, and to capture voices. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have a very big uh, kind of respectability vision where the point is to collect and preserve all the stories that make African-Americans appear a certain way as a cer having a certain type of impact. And also, you know, this whole vindicationist look, see, we're good enough, look at what we've done, we're human. <laughs> you know, so there's a whole piece there where people have that expectation for what preservation is. We say, we're as good as, include us. And then another that says, break the walls down, uh, hold the most multiplicity, open it up. And it's a continual opening and welcoming a multiplicity and possibility. And, and that's where I'm hoping that where my aspiration is, is that we trust in multiplicity and holding it and living with it and facing it, um, which is risky because <laughs> it doesn't always have the outcomes and the appearances that, you know, the gatekeepers you were talking about are, are comfortable with, Stephanie. Yeah, very true. And how are we defining this value, right? I mean, we know that the yeah. archives have, been, have not been this inclusive space and even what we're valuing, you know, um, and how we're, we're processing that. So for example, you know, and like I talk a lot about the geography, that's a big part of the work I yes. do. We know in the African-American tradition, a lot of these kind of archives um, are in Bibles, right? And in like, yes, in the earth and like in cemeteries. And, you know, I went to this one cemetery and there's this way where they have the headstones. It looks like there's very much some type of like traditional African, you know, spirituality connected to that. Mm -hmm. These are things that are going to be kind of, there's no necessarily systems in place to capture you know, these type of um, archives in that, that same way. So I know that there are so many amazing people that are doing work to kind of, so we need to rethink and decolonize this idea. We have to decolonize. I mean, and that's part of, well, we're going to show some of our new features momentarily on the Atlas that we hope allow for some of that. But I want to make sure Skylar is able to uh, ask one of her pointed questions as, a, as a, an archivist um, herself uh doing this work uh what do, what do you want to ask our guest skylar well i have definitely enjoyed listening to you guys thus far um, <laughs> um it is very very um interesting and i love the way that you put that um stephanie the systems to capture um you know the archives systems to capture black archives so my question uh first to stephanie is is what advice do you give to those doing um, family archival work in regard to navigating um, family dynamics, whether that be the many generations, you know, socioeconomic status, and all of that that goes into um, managing air property and and such. Mm. Hope that was <laughs> hope that wasn't too much <laughs> in one question. No, that, that's excellent. And I know that that's something even in my family, um, we are having these conversations because at the Black Communities Conference that we went to, you know, we talked about that. And again, 
how things are done are not supported by like this overall system, right? So this idea of everybody knows that, you know, great, great granny gave us this property, but, you know, this now when we, you know, she's passed or a disaster has happened or whatever, it's not going to be honored the same way. So I think trying to have these conversations and balance that and make people aware of, you know, how we can protect and support ourselves. Um, one of the things too that is coming up is this idea around trauma. And in all of this history and all of this work that I'm doing, and even in my own family, there's like a lot of trauma and a lot of um, secrets <laughs> that come out of this doing this genealogy work, you know? And so I really, think, um, you know, having some kind of connection to some kind of mental health resources in a lot of ways, you know, is really important. Um, so I'm hopefully I'm answering your questions. Okay. Yes, yes, it, that's, that's perfect. That yeah. is really, so, you definitely yeah. did. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, so uh, did you have a, I know that we have uh, some constraints on uh, time uh, with our guests. We have some constraints on time. So uh, Skylar, um, or actually, uh, one of our other students, I want to, uh, Jennifer, if, if you needed uh, an opportunity to pose your question, uh, feel free to, I'm not putting you on the spot. Um, but there was another really interesting uh, question that uh, Valentina, one of our other team, uh, members of our team, who had some other questions. I don't know if you will want to share any of her questions, Skylar. Yeah, we, <laughs> we have one for um, Sarah, actually, um, and it's a little bit of a lengthy one, um, but I, or, or two-part, I guess. Yeah. Um, is there a line that non-Blacks should not cross when challenging racial hierarchies, whether it's through archival work or any other kind of research, um, specifically drawing from more radical Black thinkers that support Black nationalism and strongly believe that Black archives um, and militancy towards the progress of Black folks should be done by Black folks exclusively. How would you respond to those sentiments? Um, yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, I know I always think about my friend, Spencer Corrales. He's a librarian at Illinois, and he has a, a maxim. He repeated this a lot at a institute that we went to last mm -hmm. summer. Um, which is no about us without us. So I think that's just this reminder that um, we should not have, um, I don't know, a team of all white librarians and archivists representing the history of communities of color um, without the participation of members of those communities. And I think that that issue of community participation and involvement um, has mm -hmm. been a little bit of a bugaboo for me. In, <laughs> in the past few years, I was on a project where every time someone used the word community, they sort of looked at me fearfully, knowing that I was going to <laughs> ask them what they meant by community, because that term has come in so many ways to it's um, we see it used a lot in predominantly white groups to refer to this um, collective of others without really specifying any of the complexity of that. So I think the point about um, with the Texas Freedom Colonies that res is, is there a respectability goal? Is there a multiplicity goal? Is there a goal of uh, broad representation? I think that's just a, such a beautiful example of how a community project is complicated and there's not this single voice that a group of people is going to speak in to represent. So exactly. Uh, yeah. So additionally, I think having sort of one person as a representative member is also extremely problematic. Um, but that's a little sidebar. So yeah, I think having more models in place in terms of ownership where the ownership is not passed to a holding institution, um, if that isn't the will and the desire of the people who created those materials and who are represented in those materials is yes. incredibly I, I, yeah. important. Sarah, and also not deferring to yeah. a single representative to make that decision, which 
Yeah, that's huge, Sarah, what you're saying, because there are individuals who come to me and they want to give me boxes of information and they happen to be Anglo. And I say, where did you get it? And do, why do you assume that those people who originally owned it wanted to have it at A&M? And as much as I could just say, give it, give it, give me. And even if you take it to Prairie View down the road or you take it to uh, you know, Houston Tillotson, or you take it anywhere, you know, you really have to think through this issue of this, you know, do you need someone to help you, you know, steward it, or do you want to, what is it you're really trying to get done? Uh, black, white, any institution, when you decide to give something to an institution, what are you giving and why are you giving it and what's your expectation? And one of the things Sarah and I are working on is how we clearly articulate those in trainings and outreach, because there needs to be a lot of understanding of exactly what you're giving and why you're giving it and what people are allowed to do with it when they get it. Um, I'm going on a tangent now, but Stephanie, um, I realize that both of you have to go, but I want to give you the last word, Stephanie, on um, these issues of ethics and where you'd like to see us go, especially in Black Texans and doing this kind of work. You know, what's, what's next in your mind? Right. Yeah, that's the question. What is it? It is a question. <laughs> I mean, I was, and when Sarah was talking, I was totally with her because, I mean, that is a big issue. I mean, thinking about who, again, has access, who are the gatekeepers to this, a lot of this, and yeah. I, the irony of, you know, the city and like KUT, you know, being kind of the keepers of a lot of this when a lot of this displacement was facilitated by the city, you know, and UT played a role, like when you're thinking about Wheatville and, and different things. So, um, yeah, that's, that's um, real. So where we go, again, I mean, this may seem cheeky or something, but having like some serious conversations, like I feel like there, we're not being honest about a lot of things, you know, and kind of even who is at the table around these conversations and this work and why. Um, I've just, I've been really grateful for all of the amazing folks that I've worked with through, you know, we have this newly formed historical commission, the Travis County Heritage Commission, you know, tiny yeah. boys and all of that work, but, you know, continuing to make sure that we're all at the table. And I mean, there's certain things that we're going to have to not be a part of. Like I have actively had to say, I am not going to necessarily be part of this project or that project exactly. because of the intent behind it, because of who, you know, what this is kind of a thinly veiled, um, attempt to do some other work right and so I think yeah how nicely I said that and so yeah so <laughs> I really just I think that that's kind of identifying your allies really personally thinking about them. yeah so what this work is and you know how all the ways that it kind of um extends into social justice into equity you know and and right. just kind of re reclaiming but this reconciliation of you know being really honest and truth telling, you know, and that's not something that people are, you know, always really comfortable with, but it, it has to be done. Thank you all so much for this. Um